Okay, welcome back to Communist Radio. We're really pleased to have Tom here this time. Uh, Fiona is up in Manchester today, uh, off on her tour. We've got Tom here. Tom's a member of the Central Committee of the Revolutionary Communist Party and also just fresh now off a plane back from Brazil where you're visiting our comrades. Yeah, yeah, no pleasure to be here, Ben. Uh, yeah, I'm feeling a little bit jet lagged, but I've had a coffee, so I'm I'm feeling ready to go. Um, but Good. Yeah, excited to All right. Yeah. Well, we'll hear a little bit about your your trip to Brazil uh, later on, but I think first things first. The main headline news in Britain today is this approaching uh, hurricane. I think probably by the time this podcast goes out, actually, the hurricane will have hit in Florida. And we've been seeing all the pictures. The BBC's got a live feed of all the pictures of backed up motorways, people trying to evacuate. It looks, I mean, it's a category five hurricane. It looks like it's going to be really devastating. And it comes right on the heels of Hurricane Helen, which hit the same approximate region of the Southeast United States uh, just just last week, I think it was just a couple of weeks ago. And I mean, when I was reading about this, in fact, just be- just before we started uh, recording this now, we were having a look at some of the headlines about Hurricane Helen. And it said things like, some of the headlines are, Hurricane Helen was wetter and windier due to climate change. Hurricanes like Helen are twice as likely to happen due to global warming. And then one opinion piece in the New York Times says, there is no climate haven. We all live in Florida now. And you just feel like this is, we are now in this new climactic period i think this is what it feels like that there is there has been a a a significant shift and we're going to see more and more events like this yeah absolutely i mean it just seems like the new normal right i think you see like what is it It, the degrees are like it's 1.5 degrees Mm. uh, world temperatures over 1.5 degrees um since of like pre-industrial levels right and i think it's not just hurricanes that we're seeing right you see like uh, forest fires in Greece, mm-hmm. you see flooding, um, you see all these sort of events that are happening across the world. And it is, yeah, they feel like they're piling on top of each other, right? And there's a huge cost. Yeah, that's it. Is it no, it's a, and uh, yeah, cost is the right word. It's a massive cost because this is the new normal. There does feel like a, a shift. And the cost is huge in terms of the immediate cost to human life. but all, and, and I suppose the immediate property damage, the cost of that. But it's, it's more profound than that, because I think this year, for the first time, there are going to be climate refugees, people living in places which basically become uninhabitable for one reason or another, rising sea, temp- uh, sea levels, for example, and they're having to move their homes. Yeah, I mean, it's not just one-off events that we're talking about in terms of hurricanes. It's a, a complete change to environments, right? As you said, with the with this like deserts becoming uninhabitable, millions of people will be forced out to flee their homes to find uh, safer places to live. I mean, this is part of like the migrant crisis in, in Europe with the people yeah. fleeing into the Mediterranean, uh, the huge cost of that alone, right? Um, but yeah, it's going to have huge consequences for world trade as well yes yeah that's it that's Um, the other side of it i mean uh, i saw the the panama canal this year at the close because they couldn't fill the canal and this will have huge consequences for the world market i mean this hundreds of millions a day i think that was costing yeah and this yeah it's one of the main arteries for world trade um and you know what will happen when this thing's closed is that the the cost will go up for shipping these these items around you know the coast of south america um and that cost will be pushed onto the working class the people that buy these commodities right? yes. they'll have to bear the brunt of this these sorts of uh these events that are happening yeah that's right yeah and i mean just in panama canal is a specific example and i suppose the examples can are many but in general, from a general point of view, back in June, there was a report that was published that said that for every one degree, this was published by the World Economic Forum, for every one degree that the world, that the global temperature increases, that will cost about 12% of global GDP. So this is a major issue. And this is also why the, the capitalist class at their, at their World Economic Forum in Davos that they have, they they do pay a lot of attention to climate change because it is expensive for them. Also, they obviously don't care. They, it doesn't matter to them at all about the climate refugees, about um, about the loss of life and anything else, unless it's a question of of money and their profits. But this is this is going to have a serious impact on world economic development. This this climate change, as well as yeah, migration patterns and people's lives and and all the rest of it. 
Uh, and I think what you're seeing above all, and, and w- as, as communists, as Marxists, any phenomenon, whether it's an economic question or climate change or anything else, what we're always mainly interested in is how this is going to have an impact on people's consciousness. That's the point. We're interested in the science, obviously. We're we're curious about things but mainly what we're concerned with is this thing that's happening this process that's going on what impact is it having on the consciousness of millions of working class people around the world and i think what you're seeing with climate change is that it is really exposing inequality above all um i'd say inequality between nations but also inequality between people within individual nations if you take nations, for example, um, I think it's the top 20 nations uh, are responsible for something like 83% of the emissions. Like the, the 20 biggest, uh, some of the richest countries basically are responsible for 20% of the emissions. And yet, it will be the poorest nations, places like Bangladesh, where they have had massive flooding, that will have to pay the cost. Or the small island nations that, that won't exist anymore as the, as the sea levels rise. So the rich pollute and it's the poor who pay the price. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the rich of these countries can just fly off to somewhere safer. Yeah. Uh, it's it's not a choice for, for people who can't afford to move from their homes, right? Um, so, yeah, like the huge inequality that exists in the world today is, is yeah, bears, you know, a much more burden on the shoulders of the working class because they're the ones that are going to suffer the most from these events, whereas the rich can just fly off to somewhere safer. Um so it's a lot easier choice for them. Yeah, that's it. And and like the, and those rich, um, or the, sorry, those poorer countries, they can't invest. Like right now, the US is spending a lot of money on on hurricane defenses. Is the hurricane is so massive that people are still having to evacuate. Mm-hmm. But there, I was reading about all the preparations they're making for food to be provided to, to people for all kinds of emergency funds and stuff. But flooding in Bangladesh, what kind of emergency funds do they have to deal with that? These poorer countries that are most affected by climate change as a result of the pollution of the richer countries are also the ones that have the least money to to do anything about it, to to help the the, the workers and young people and everybody else in the, the populations of those countries. But then it's also within the rich countries themselves. It's it's I mean, who is responsible for the vast majority of emissions? I can't remember exactly where I read this, but it's it's something like the top hundred or top two hundred companies in, for example, the United States, are responsible for 80% of the emissions in that country. It's the biggest corporations, it's the super rich, it's the CEOs and the shareholders who are responsible for this stuff. And yet, it's us, it's ordinary people, it's working class people who will have a, uh, you know, polluted air and rivers, for example, or uh, whose houses will be destroyed by natural disasters. So it's also, I think, exposing the inequality between people within nations between rich and poor within uh within nations i think this is having a big i think this this can only have a big impact on consciousness yeah yeah absolutely and it's not just the inequality that we're talking about between people but it also exposes the inequalities of governments and institutions yeah, at yeah. the same time mm. um you see cop right mm. uh like this this meeting of all the big bodies in the world yeah, that are coming together shop. to solve this climate crisis but i think the big question for a lot of people is has anything changed i mean it was hosted in saudi arabia uh, last year um was it hosted by like an oil company yeah uh, i think that's <laughs> right the, the bloke chairing it was a, is some kind of executive of an oil company yeah D- does an oil company have any interest in solving this crisis uh it, that is needed to be solved pretty soon in terms of this right like um no right he's got to protect his own profits uh, first and foremost so these bodies that meet together are just i think for a lot of people seen as, as useless right and uh, like the same with the un who come together this one it's one of their big issues that they talk about they're one of the big crises facing humankind mm. and yet for the past i mean i don't know how long um, i've been paying attention to cop but i don't think any resolution has come through that has been meaningful or has actually been put into practice yeah that's right it's just words they yeah. don't do anything with it yeah that's it and i mean it, the, you're talking about institutions that's right but it's also governments the US, for example, I think it was this week or maybe last week, said we that there, there's a shortfall. They said we've got a shortfall of eight eight billion dollars or something in the hurricane fund or the fund for helping people affected by hurricanes. The week prior to that, they had just agreed something like an eight point seven billion 
uh, package of funding for Israel to carry on their genocide in the Middle East and their war against Lebanon, their genocide in Palestine and their war against Lebanon. Uh, so you can see, like, it's exposing the individual governments as well. They've got the money. They're just not doing, they're, they're not investing it in, in the place where it needs to be. Yeah, same thing for the UK government. Uh, yeah. yeah. You know, Keir Starmer's Labour Party wanted to come in with this Green New Deal, what was it, 27, 28 billion mm -hmm. um, to invest in green energy, scrapped before they even got into government. Um, and it's not even, a, it's, it's a drop in the ocean compared to what they're willing to spend, you know, on nuclear arms, like Trident 200 billion, yeah. doesn't even work. Um, you know, you've got you know, 3 billion that they're going to give to Ukraine. Uh, all this money they're willing to give to war uh, to chase their increasing the defense spending to two and a half percent of GDP. Yeah, and and you know twenty eight billion is, isn't even close to enough to what we we need to actually tackle this crisis in Britain. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think we see all these governments really showing where their interests lie. It's not in actually fixing the problems of everyday life, uh, the huge questions on people's lips that they want solved. I mean. Young people talk about this all the time. Yeah. They go out on the streets. It's about climate change yeah. for a lot of these people. But these governments are not answering that call yeah. at all. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, it was, as you say, it's, it is on everybody's mind. Last year, I remember reading, it was towards the start of this year, but last year, 2023, the word of the year was climate change, with words, I suppose, of the year was climate change. Amongst That's amongst like school kids, I think, the, the survey was done. The kids' word of the year was was climate change. Yeah, it's on their minds. This is what people care about. And yet, and you can see that the money is there, and yet all this money is funneled um, towards war uh, and and weapons production and things like this. And I think, I mean, this is this is the point that uh, this is where we get to the the most important point, I think, because the reason that this is done. I mean, we've discussed this before when we've discussed here on this podcast and in our articles on the website. We've discussed books, not bombs. We've discussed imperialism and why the capitalists are forced to fund weapons, for example, and why they're forced. They're not, they're, it's not just because they're all awful people. I mean, they are, most of them. The, the, the Keir Starmers and Joe Bidens of the world uh, and, and the capitalists, the owners of the big companies, the arms companies and so on. But they, they have to do it because that is the logic of the capitalist system. And I think this is the point about climate change that what you realize and the more the international institutions are exposed, the governments are exposed. What it exposes is that the capitalist system itself is incapable of finding a solution to this problem because capitalism is based on short-term profit and competition between individual companies and nations. That is that Those are the foundations of capitalism. It's in its DNA. But to solve the climate crisis, what you actually need is long-term planning, long-term investment, and cooperation between nations to to solve this problem capitalism is literally incapable of doing that it cannot be solved on this basis which is why every cop meeting ends in failure and complete inaction i think um <clears throat> to break or, or to, to solve the climate problem you have to break the capitalist system i think that's the only way yeah i completely agree i mean you look at all these you know they, they act in their own individual interest right like they, they want to you know seek profit it costs you know millions sometimes billions to put you know up a new oil refinery and you know these things are still being made today like they can't just close these down because they still need to make a profit from these these um huge piece, pieces of infrastructure so it's not in the interest of these individual capitalists to solve this crisis and um, because they can only see what's in front of them um it needs as you say long-term planning in the hands of the working class the people then see this problem feel this problem the most and you know have the solutions to this problem you know these people work in these industries in green technology the technology exists um but it can't be put into a large scale because it doesn't work for the profit of shareholders and ceos of these companies that also lobby governments in their own interest to further delay the, yeah. the tackling of this crisis. yes that is very true fossil fuel companies do lobby against, for example, subsidies for green technologies like solar panels and things like this. Uh, on the grounds that it will distort the free market. Mm. Uh, so on, on, on capitalist grounds, which actually in reality doesn't really even apply to them because they get subsidies and hands out and handouts anyway, these fossil fuel companies. But yeah, this is the point. Like the whole the whole thing is rotten to the core. And yeah, the way what we're what we are talking about here is saying is making the argument that um <clears throat> these 
capitalist governments, these capitalists who run these businesses, these energy companies, the transport companies, and the banks that do the investment, for example, they are willing to literally take the world to into an abyss, into, into barbarism. And they're willing to do it for their profits. They have, we say they have no right to do that. Mm. It's, it's perfectly legal under capitalism. These are the laws that capitalism makes, but we say that is, we, we don't recognize that, that right that they are asserting. We say they do not have that right. And we say we're going to take that stuff off them. They, they are, if they're willing to drive us over a cliff, we're going we're gonna to take their hands off the wheel. We should take those banks, those insurance companies, the biggest businesses, the energy industries, the transport uh, sector, the infrastructure, and so on. All, this, all, all these companies that are responsible for all these emissions, we're going to take all of that out of their hands, no compensation. They have, they have proven themselves completely irresponsible and not deserve any compensation and put it in the hands of the working class for us to run it and plan it in the interests of need in long term, uh, in a long term way. Because if you do that, you could rationally plan. That's the point. You could plan the economy properly. Instead of all this anarchic competition where it's not in anybody's interest to invest for the long term or protect the environment, all they're interested in is more profit because they've got to compete with the guy next to them. Instead, you could plan the economy and you could plan it in a way that is compatible with environmental protection and you could take all that money that is currently invested in weapons for example or in other completely useless speculative things and invest it instead in things we actually need like green technology there are vast piles of cash around the place there's huge amounts of technological potential which is just not realized because it's not profitable to do it but if you remove that question of profit from the equation you can solve this problem this climate uh, thing yeah and it's, a, it's an emergency plan that is needed right like it needs to be done soon i think Look, young people today feel so much anxiety around this question. It looms over their entire life, um, essentially. Yeah. It's, it's an existential question. It is literally being forced into barbarism. People see barbarism across the world and they look at their own life and see like, what kind of future do, do I have? Do my potential kids have? All these sorts of things. And I think it creates a huge anxiety in society um i was reading like an article or a report this week that says you know all these climate scientists coming together and saying like the future of humanity uh, hangs in the balance yeah and people that's the state of the world that people can't see a future and they they, they can't see a future under under capitalism right it doesn't it doesn't actually provide them with any future any any resolution to any of these problems that they feel um so yeah i think that's the thing it's like I think for me and for you, Ben, it's like we, we feel optimistic about the future. We feel that something can change, yeah. but it is a requirement that communism, that the system change has to be done to actually tackle any of these problems. I think that's it. And I, th I think that is what is... Because I, I also when I, when I read the news about the climate, it is depressing. Yeah. I, I, feel, <laughs> I, I read it and I think, bloody hell, this is not looking good. Mm. You cannot help but do that because, but the, and and you can tell that that is what all the climate scientists think as well. But I'll tell you why it's a bit depressing to read the news about this stuff. It's because I because I also I read a Guardian article about this report that you're talking about that came out uh, the other day, um, <clears throat> saying that the future of humanity hangs in the balance. All these indicators are showing that the uh, the climate crisis is at a tipping point, at a critical moment, and so on. Yeah, and and the climate scientist solution at the end of it is COP twenty nine. This, this really has to make some changes. And you cannot help but, but read all this doom and gloom. And then, and then their solution is COP29. You think, well, then there is no solution. Because everybody can, as we talked about, everyone can see straight through that. So obviously reading this stuff in the, in the bourgeois press, it, is, it will get you down. And I think a lot, as you say, a lot of young people feel like that. But this is the thing about communists is that we are relentlessly optimistic because we can see... The problem is these scientists, they can't see beyond capitalism. And if you can see a world beyond capitalism, if you can see a program like what I just outlined about nationalizing and, and, and expropriating and putting under democratic workers' control the biggest businesses and planning for need and not profit, if you see a world based on that, then actually you do see a solution that could be implemented very, very quickly to this climate crisis. And... And that's not a, it's not a completely mad pie in the sky idea. It's, you explain it in that way to anybody. It's a popular idea. It's a sensible idea. Nobody, apart from oil executives, nobody's running around saying, no, actually, I think we should carry on uh, killing the planet. Um, it's a popular idea. The capitalist system has never probably been more discredited than it is today. 
people are desperately looking for an alternative in many cases a revolutionary alternative it the field is wide open for ideas and above all because obviously this program that i've outlined it's not going to be done through certainly obviously you're not going to convince the capitalists to to hand over their businesses it'll need a struggle and that struggle needs to take on a mass character it needs to be a struggle of workers uh, acting in an organized way for, I'm, I'm thinking it is methods like the, the classic methods of the class struggle strike action workplace occupations for example mass street demonstrations ultimately with a view to bringing down a, a capitalist government and putting a workers government in power basically a workers and, and in fact not just a workers government within the kind of setup that we have today but you expropriate the businesses and you create a new kind of state that will administer those businesses uh, and, and run the economy basically in the interest of the working class. Yeah, this is what we're talking about. Um, it's not a small thing, but but that is more possible today probably, I would say, than it has ever been throughout history because the working class is so numerous uh, today and, and therefore much more capable of carrying out this kind of... It, this is a revolution. What I'm describing is a revolution. And it is, it's probably more possible today than ever. But we're not really seeing that being offered anywhere at the moment, right? No, no, I think what we see today is there's there is a lack of leadership really um that is that can sort of channel all this frustration and and anxiety about life into something meaningful. I mean, what what do we have um you know failures of the left of the past have you know not really changed anything in terms of uh, we're talking about climate nothing has changed in the climate. Uh, it's only continued to get worse. So so yeah, we I mean that's what we're trying to build. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, that is the, the whole point of the Revolutionary Communist Party. Because the, the raw material for, for a revolutionary movement is there, and the raw material for a new kind of society, the, the money, the technology, and everything else is there. But yeah, what's lacking is that is that driving force, this, this conscious struggle for socialism, basically. And I wish we could be that right now, but the the RCP is, uh, as we've discussed many times, is simply not big enough yet. Um, <clears throat> we are working on that. That's why we're having a big recruitment drive. That's why we're trying to grow. We're trying to grow and educate ourselves in some of these arguments in offering this kind of um, this alternative. Um, but that's that's our mission at this stage. Uh, and so that yeah, when I see stuff about Hurricane Milton in in the press this morning. Uh, the first thing I think of, well, it, it is uh, kind of through it through this this discussion that we've just had, where you get to is is the burning need for a revolutionary alternative to this system, and therefore the need for a revolutionary party in the RCP. But um, <clears throat> I mean, this is an important discussion, and it's and and we'll have we can't delve into it too much here, but it is coming up, isn't it, at our our event in November? Uh, we've got the Revolution Festival coming up, and this talk is on the agenda for that yeah I'm, I'm very excited to, to hear more about this i think it's uh yeah as i've said before right it's um a question on everyone's lips and mm. you know we're gonna have like yeah a thousand people coming down to london to yeah listen to all kinds of talks not just about climate it's not the only issue in, in the world today i mean what we've got with this hurricane it's not even the only crisis that's going to be going on in america um there's so many things and then it's just going to happen after the election we're going to host this event um, so we're going to be talking after gonna, the U.S. presidential election. The US, I should say, yeah. Um, and we, yeah, we're going to have a comrade from America, from the Revolutionary Communists of America, to come down and talk about yeah, the election, which I'm very excited to hear about and very excited to see what the the Americans have to have to bring to the table. Yeah, definitely. I think that would be really uh, good. We're, I'm very much looking forward to that. Uh, we've also got. I mean, look, we've talked here about Labour's U-turn, for example. You were mentioning it over the question of. Uh, green investment and we there is a talk at the revolution festival on labor and power from 1924 to today and it's a look at various labor governments in that time and the the betrayals basically they've carried out now in this particular case they u-turned on that promise of green investment before they even came to power but that is basically typically the story of labor governments in power is that promises are made uh, people are energized and excited for that as an alternative to the tories but then those promises are are dropped, basically. And uh, this is a, a pattern that's gone on for the last hundred years. So this talk on the Labour Party will also be quite interesting because it's also there's lessons in there about well, how do you fight back then against Labour governments that that do things like this? The working class has done that 
on numerous occasions over the over the last period. So I think that will also be another very solid talk. Yeah, and I mean, we talked about, you know, the climate here in, in terms of like, you know, the, the politics uh, revolve around it, but also like science. We're going to talk about um, and the need to, to fight for a dialectical materialist approach in science. I think in science today, we see a lot of idealism, um, you know, this idea is like, like thinking that, you know, all these things come from yourself and then you reflect upon the world. But yeah, I think for what we stand for, we stand for dialectical materialism, the idea that, you know, yeah, we can understand the world uh, and we can also change it as well. I think, yeah, it's going to be a very interesting talk to fight for the, the right philosophy in science. I think is an important task as well for communists. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. No, I mean, I think it'll be, we talked last time about uh, but with uh, when Khaled was here, we talked about books, not bombs, and and the Revolution Festival is going to be a big anti-imperialist conference. But it it will also cover these kind of topics, basically. On it's a bit of a school of communism. Um, and I mean, well, Tom, you're you're also, you're one of the organisers for this for the whole Revolution Festival. Mm. Uh, I mean, how is it looking in terms of attendance and other things so far? Yeah, I mean, we're we're doing well so far. We've got over 500 tickets. I think we're at like maybe 550, 530, if I remember correctly. So yeah, we're looking pretty good. I hope we get to the 1,000. I think that would be a, an amazing result. Um, and yeah, we're going to have a lot of international visitors. As I've already mentioned, the Comrade from America. We'll have Canada, France, Germany, Austria, Spain. I could go on and on and on, but yeah, it's looking to be not just a, a great event for you know, communists in Britain, but yeah, bringing together a whole international aspect of it as well. I think that's a really inspiring part of Revolution Festival and it's something very exciting. It is it's one of the most inspiring parts, I think. And um, I mean, what well, I'm also talking of internationalism. I am very interested to hear about your visit to our comrades in brazil mm. i think you, you were going we 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 literally haven't had a chance to catch up about this because it's yeah. first thing on wednesday morning and you're only just back in the office so i am interested to hear right now what you've got to say um because <clears throat> that was that was a, in sao paulo i believe yeah they would do they were having a, a camp that was in some way similar to the revolution festival that we were organizing how how was that in a nutshell i mean yeah talking about inspiring uh, yeah it makes you really feel part of something much bigger i mean it was we talking to like comrades in Brazil that had, had just joined like this huge new energy to this this party that they founded over in Brazil. Uh, it's it's really inspiring to see, this, you know, one month, two months, three months, four months, part of the organization and, and getting up there and giving contributions and talks and speeches. And like, yeah, I think it was an incredible experience and it, yeah, it's really driven me to feel like, yeah, this, we're part of something so much bigger uh, here in the RCP than just the fight in Britain, but it's also for the fight yeah, across the world like in places like brazil that is really uh, what 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 kind of things were they discussing what topics yeah did they have um a lot of the focus was on you know the life of lenin um you know war and militarism these huge questions as well uh and yet yeah, building the, the the communist party in brazil um how how do they fight for you know a bigger party how do they grow all these things the thing that is necessary most really is to to like like in britain we're not big enough they're also not big enough but they they need to fight for that and get more and more communists around them because yeah i think what they've learned and what we've learned from the past is like communists do exist it's just the case of trying to find them um so yeah they did a lot of range of topics uh, and all very very good from what i could understand yeah yeah did it was it did you ever translate you don't speak portuguese i don't speak portuguese they, they... Bon dia. Uh, that's all i've got <laughs> all right, but um yeah i had translated because yeah again these 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 comrades are part of an international that we all speak uh you know in in same languages but you know the, the general lessons of communism were still there yeah that's good were there other visitors from the yeah i should mention Communist yeah um an american comrade a mexican comrade italian comrades uh canadian as well so yeah a really good mix of, of comrades and um yeah it's the first time a lot of the brazilian comrades got to meet some of the international uh, and so i was a lot of questions were asked of me what we're doing in britain so it was, it was a very nice event and uh, yeah great okay well, hopefully the Revolution Festival in London in November can be as inspiring for all of our international guests mm. as it sounds like that Brazilian camp was for you. Um, so, yeah, I mean, with that in mind, anyone who hasn't yet got their ticket for the Revolution Festival should do so. And also, if you were, I mean, beyond that, 
if you if you are not if you're listening to this and you're not yet a member of the Revolutionary Communist Party and the Revolutionary Communist International, then you should sign up and join and help us. Because when you're reading stuff about the climate, for example, about Hurricane Milton in the news, um, this is easy to feel despair. It's easy to feel pessimistic. But what the fight for socialism and the fight for communism offers is is a complete alternative. And it is a, a realistic fight. It's, it's within our grasp, basically. Uh, it just requires the building of a, a powerful revolutionary party to connect those ideas to the wider movement. So if you're not already a member, then join up now. Absolutely. Okay, thanks very much, Tom.